everyone's here. Uh, I'm Gordon Smith. I'm the superintendent of schools here, and we're excited to have a community forum and update all of you on the feasibility study that's going on and the project that hopefully will happen at East Longmeadow High School. And so tonight, um, we're going to be not only doing an update, we'll go through a lot of the information, early on information for people who might not have come to some of the other public forums, but then we will get into the tax impact and some of the things that were asked at our last public forum. So I know a number of people who came in early, they were asking about that. So that's coming. Have to live through a few slides before, but we will have that information for you. Um, and then we'll go into next steps, because we're in schematic design. So one of the things to keep in mind is now we can get more precise. So the numbers we give you may change as we go through schematic design. That's something also to keep in mind. So why don't we begin? So just to give you an idea, many of, if not all, of our school building committee <coughs> are here in the room. So I'm just going to ask them. You can see their names on screen, but if they could just stand up for a moment. Members of the school building committee. All right. See them all throughout the room. This is the group. Question. Can you switch to the Yeah, you can. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I can. Thank you. That'd probably be wise, wouldn't it? that better? Okay. Should we have the school building committee stand up again? <laughs> that was live, so. So this is a group who's working hard, looking at not only all the different things that are coming before us in terms of the MSBA process, but also working closely with the design team and out in the community getting feedback from all of you. Not only community forums, but just in what they do on a daily basis in their different positions in town um, and as residents of the town. So take a look at the names. Any one of them can help out with questions if questions come up after the public forum, and you can always certainly contact me. We also have members of our design team and our owner project manager team here. Why don't we have them stand up? You can have a number of them presenting tonight. All right. I'll hear from them in just a moment. Actually, you'll hear from Ben Murphy from Skanska right now. Thank you, Gordon, and good evening, everyone. So I'm Ben Murphy with Skanska, the owner's project manager. Um, what you're looking at up on the screen uh, is the overall schedule for the project, uh, which has been broken out by the seven uh, MSBA uh, modules. And so this project started quite a long time ago, back in uh, 2019, actually, um, when the statement of interest for the school building was accepted by the Mass School Building Authority, and the town was ultimately, at the end of 2019, invited into the MSBA's program. And with that, the town then needed to form a project team. And so from December 2021, uh, well, in December 2021, uh, they selected Skanska as the owner's project manager. Uh, we then worked with the town to help bring a design team on board. And in May of 2022, uh, the town selected Jones Whitsett Architects in association with Sims Mania McKee Architects, who you'll be hearing from later in the presentation. And so once our team was established, we then uh, started a feasibility study, which went from May 2022 and just concluded back in uh, March of this year. Um, and during the feasibility study, uh, the project team, along with the school building committee, uh, analyzed many different options for the project. And through that process, uh, the committee selected one option that was the preferred solution for the project, really the best suited uh, solution for the project. And so once that was established, uh, we've now moved into schematic design, which is where you see the red ball at the top there. That's our current uh, progress. And so the schematic design uh, period, it's a really important one because the, it's where the design team starts to take a lot of the information from the previous feasibility study and start to develop that further. So the programming, the you know, conceptual design, they start to actualize that into design documents. Um, and with that set of documents at the end of schematic design, uh, we will then be estimating the project again. When we get those estimates back, that's an important point because we then establish the total project budget and that's what kind of sets in stone the number for the, uh, for the funding for Module 5, the uh, townwide vote. So that leads us into Module 5 up on the screen. Uh, the townwide vote to approve the project will be held on November 7th. 
And assuming a vote in favor, a majority in favor of the project, um, the project will then enter into detailed design where the uh, documents will be uh, completed to a point where the construction manager who will also be brought on board during the detailed design period, um, we will look to them to bid out the, uh, the documents to the various trades necessary to complete the project. And once our construction team is assembled, uh, we will begin construction, which we have uh, targeted to begin in July of next year, July of 2024, with a move-in date into the new building in August of 2026. Um, and then just uh, the phase two, which would be the demolition of the existing building and the buildup of the, uh, the hardscape and the landscape taking place after that in uh, spring of 2027. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and as Ben said, as you looked at that schedule, um, we started last spring, and we started last spring putting together an idea of what East Long Meadow High School could look like going from the current years, <coughs> next few years, all the way 50 years into the future. And we started to talk with folks not only at National Night Out and at different forums, but um, at different venues and start to, we also had an online, um, last August online survey, started to get ideas from them. And the number one thing that came back is that they wanted a student-centered learning situation, but interesting enough that kept coming back, they wanted something that was modern um, and something that can take our students and support our students well into the future. And so We've continued to take feedback and build on that vision, and that's brought us to where we are this evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Fangsness. Uh, I'm also a, a member of the class of 2001, a landscape architect with SMMA. Uh, so when we evaluate a site, we like to start by zooming out and taking a look at the campus in its broader context. We're very fortunate here. This campus is only about three quarters of a mile to the west of the center of town in the Rotary. And then we have this beautiful 60 plus acre campus set in what is actually a fairly densely developed and populated area. We have residences to the west and to the north, St. Michael's Parish uh, to the east, some wooded resource areas to the east as well, and to a little bit to the south. And then we do have some additional industrial businesses and uh, residential properties to the south as well. You know, the existing building sits within the heart of the campus. And right now we have three access points. Uh, the main one is, of course, what we call the, the horseshoe across from Melwood on Maple Street. Then we have another site access point at the northeast corner of the site from Maple Street and one from Norton Street at the southwest corner. And so as we start to zero in and look at the, the campus itself, you know, I'm an optimist. Let's talk about the good, right? There's a lot of good that this campus uh, brings. It, like I said, it's, it's a massive public open, open green space, and it serves a dual function. It, it, its spaces, its recreation fields around the perimeter of the building serve both the school curriculum and the school rec, uh, athletic program but it also serves the broader community. And this is a real hub for community activities, things like summer concerts, things like uh, the start of the parade, things like Fourth of July fireworks, and even just recreational athletics. A lot of people come to this wonderful space to use it. And it's a real wealth. It's a real resource. So those are the good things. But the campus does have its challenges. And Without getting too detailed, what these photographs show on the right is that, in general, this campus has served the community for a long time and it's served its well. But the materials, the things like walkways, you know, pavement, curbing, things of that nature, some of the systems, drainage, you know, utilities, they've reach the end of their lifespan and, and, and they're in need of replacement and they're in need of upgrades. And also on top of that, you know, this, this campus was developed a long time ago, so it really doesn't meet the modern standards of accessible universal design. So these are things that a project like this can help to improve. Uh, some other things that we discovered during the, during the study process is 
vehicular congestion. That's something, you know, especially at afternoon pickup with passenger, uh, passenger vehicles and school buses. So those are some of the things that we'll be studying. Thanks, Eric. So um, looking at the building now, um, it's, it's important to realize that this building has, you know, is over 60 years old, at least the oldest portion of it. It has, you know, had three separate um, building eras um, under its belt. And so, you know, again, it's served your uh, community really well for a very long time. Um, but, you know, the diagram on the right indicates where um, the spaces are not really meeting the needs um, of the educational vision. So the, the red spaces are all spaces that are well under, you know, it says 5%, but many of those spaces are well under what the MSBA, the Mass School Building Authority, um, you know, has as recommended sizes for, you know, sort of safe um, uh, classroom use, things like science labs that are very cramped here in this building. Um, you know, it's something that, that deserves attention. And in addition to the spatial uh, issues, um, like Eric was uh, describing, we, um, we back in June, I think it was, now we're looking at almost a year on this project, um, assessed the building's physical condition as well as its systems. So architects and engineers came over a series of days, you know, um, understood um, the documents and the physical condition um, of the building. And so, you know, again, because the building has grown over three separate um, building eras, um, the circulation is convoluted. I thank Thank you for great signage to get up here this evening. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a, there are a lot of corridors, um, and understanding where you're going is, is can be a real challenge. Um, the finishes, while they're really robust and doing pretty well for the most part, you know, are dated looking, and you know, could use a, an upgrade. Um, there are significant portions of hazardous material which the district, you know, any time an area is touched, takes care of over time. But um, certainly something to. Uh, be aware of and improve. Um, I'll come back to the roof at the end. If you're lucky you toured the building on a nice dry um, day. Um, but like the site, um, there are a lot of challenges with uh, accessibility in this, in this building. Um, the education spaces, as mentioned before, um, aren't meeting um, the district's needs. The mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems are all at the end of their useful lives. Um, Bruce and his crowd do a great job of, of keeping it up. Um, but, you know, again, 60 plus years is a long time. And finally, the envelope is very inefficient. Single pane windows, lack of insulation, um, you know, we're using a lot of energy here. So with respect to the leaking roof, um, you know, the district is, again, it's, it's chasing projects to kind of keep the facility up and running and safe for the kids, for the students. So, and I, I think um, Superintendent Smith will talk a little bit more about investments that have been made over, over time, not only for this building, but the district overall. Thanks, Helen. So just to give you an idea, because I know this was a question uh, at our last public forum, what does the district do in terms of capital planning? So one, we every year update a five-year capital plan that we put together and work closely with our superintendent of uh, Department of Public Works, Mr. Fanny, who's right over here, and I think directed one of our tours this evening, uh, and knows this building incredibly well. Uh, then the projects that we prioritize, the school committee prioritizes, um, goes through the capital planning process in the town, and then overall with the um, budget approval process, whatever projects are prioritized at the town level, then take place over the next year or so. Uh, just to give you an idea, over the last few years at Meadowbrook, which is our youngest school, we participated in two Mass School Building Authority projects in their accelerated repair program and were able to put on a new roof and put uh, all new windows and doors in. Um, and then just over the last two years, we replaced uh, four aging modular classrooms with uh, standard construction classrooms, and um, they're actually, if you haven't had a chance to go visit that, they're exceptional. Uh, and that was through the work of the DPW and contractors that um, we contracted with through the bid process. At Maple Shade, we've been able to replace the heating system. Maple Shade, if you don't know, has a steam piping system that um, is underneath all the floors. 
uh, and that was a project that just took place over the last three or four years. We're finishing up all exterior door replacement. That it was three phases, so it was over the last five years, uh, and hopefully this summer we'll have um, we'll be able to repave the parking lot and the playground. At Mountain View, last year we replaced the gym floor. Uh, we're looking to replace, and we're out in the bid process now, two aging modular classrooms, and hopefully that breaks ground this summer at Mountain View. At Birchland, which is our newest school, but actually is 23 years old, we're um, recently replaced all the rugs in the Library and Media Center and in their computer rooms, um, and we've done smaller projects on the roof. At the high school, we have looked at the switch gear because as many people know, one of the most challenging elements of just our daily operation is the electrical system here. Um, and one of the greatest challenges, as Mr. Fenny can tell you, is how much we were pushing the whole system and the threat of fire and complete shutdown. Uh, so over time, we're going to continue this project, but we did already do some replacements two summers ago, and we hope to replace more this summer uh, and keep things running here and keep fire risk down to a minimum. We've already repaired uh, one section of the roof. There's one section, this is a pretty massive roof if you were on the tour, that was a different membrane. It actually was, at the time, our worst section of roof. Now it's our best section of roof. Um, we've switched to the other side of the, of the school. Early on in my tenure as superintendent, we replaced the gym windows, and in 2011, we had a full lighting upgrade here. Uh, prior to my tenure as superintendent, they replaced the boilers. So the town and the school system continues to invest in all of our schools to make sure that they're running on a daily basis for all of our students. But there are things, certainly, that no matter what we do, um, we're not able to touch just with capital planning, and those are things like <coughs> accessibility. Um, addition of sprinklers, that's something that um, is not, it's on our capital plan, but it's not meeting the urgency of some of these other things. Uh, replacement of all the systems that we're talking about, full replacement of electrical, full replacement of HVAC, full replacement of plumbing. Abatement of hazardous materials, that happens as we get into projects. Adding insulation throughout the building, improving access to daylight, that would always be a nice thing. There was a project back, I believe, in the 70s, early 80s that limited the daylight. At the time, I think it was looking at energy efficiency. Um, major changes to the vehicular circulation, we talked about that earlier. If, if you ever stand out there at either arrival or dismissal, it's interesting. We'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> lack of a true loading or service area where you could actually get an 18 wheeler in and drop off things in an effective way. And then major changes to our classroom areas um, and major changes to the interior circulation. If you've had a chance to walk some of the halls, there are bottleneck areas that uh, on a daily basis our students all of a sudden slow down in that four minute passing time because they have to go through the bottleneck. Right now actually there's an art show down there in that area so go check it out. You can see the bottleneck and the art show. Great, thank you Gordon. So uh, I'm Christian Witsit with Jones Witsit Architects um, and again thank you for coming tonight. Uh, just to again kind of walk you through the process. Many of you have seen this slide already. Um, but in the feasibility study, we were doing that visioning to connect with the teachers, connect with the, the district and the staff, and really get an understanding for the school's needs. And at the same time, looking at the existing conditions, both site and building. And while we're doing both of those processes at the same time, we're trying to come up with a variety of options for the building committee to really evaluate, and the community to evaluate. So at the end of our initial, the feasibility study is broken into two different parts. And after that initial phase, we, had, we kind of brought these four options, both to the state, to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, who helps uh, with the funding of the project, and also to the School Building Committee. So we'll start over here on the left with option 5B, which was the most expensive, looking at a new school as well as a new community building. And that was taking some of the program from the school and, and putting it in a separate building with a pool next to the uh, next to the track and football field. 
Option 3C was looking at a new school. Option 2C was looking at an addition renovation of the existing school, trying to pick apart which portions of this building made the most sense to try to leave and where we could do a successful addition. Sometimes that works out really well for communities, um, not so much in this case. And then option one is basically a base repair, which the MSBA requires us to look at, but it's a very helpful tool to use to look at, okay, what if we didn't address the educational needs of the district at all? What if we just tried to repair this building and bring it up to code? And so really that option one is, is the option that you can kind of see what would happen if the project doesn't pass. That not necessarily all of that would need to happen at once, but that over time you would have to make those types of investments to really bring this building uh, up to code. Uh, that doesn't work. Oh, for my own trip. Um, so the, throughout the process, we've really been um, tasked by the building committee to think about the cost of doing nothing. Um, this is a, a video of some of the dripping roofs over there on the left, um, which is a, a constant reminder of one of those costs. Um, number one was really the most important part of this whole process, and that's, that's why we're here, that's why the district submitted a statement of interest to the, to the MSBA um, so long ago, is uh, really looking for facility improvements for the delivery of education, um, and that's, that's the topmost priority on, on everybody's mind. Um, if the project doesn't go forward, um, really the district is looking at piecemeal capital expenditures, um, each one of those would require a separate debt exclusion vote. Um, further complicated by the fact that we really like to try to do that over just summer, what are called summer slammers, so really during the months of July and August. So you're stuck with kind of that amount of work that you can do during that summer. You can't really um, do a whole project that would take, um, take the school longer than, than that a portion of time. Um, thinking about spreading those projects over time, what we're dealing with these days is a very high rate of escalation, so just thinking about those construction costs continuing to increase over that time. Um, as the superintendent mentioned, looking at whole-scale accessibility expenses um, is quite daunting. Um, in terms of the MSBA process, so the district actually submitted their first statement of interest back in 2014. So while the district was accepted in 2019, um, really, that, that was five years of just waiting to try to get closer to the top of the list. Um, many districts apply to the program, very few are chosen. Um, the MSBA has a difficult job of finding those that are most in need and, and putting those at the top of the process. Um, as part of the for process with the MSBA, for districts that, do, that the vote does not pass, the MSBA then refuses to participate in the cost that they've already reimbursed you for, for the phases that you've already done. So we've gone through feasibility, to feasibility. we're in schematic design right now, um, we're working with another district where the project had failed 10 years ago, um, it has now gone forward, the district was not reimbursed for the feasibility and schematic design phases of that project, even though they had to do them again, because um, again, it's been 10 years, a lot has changed, um, you need to kind of go back to the drawing board. Um, thinking about the improvements to community resources, which we'll go through in more detail. Um, reduction in property values, which um, again, every kind of new school has seen, uh, has seen an increase in property values. Uh, reduction in enrollment, and uh, risking NEASC accreditation. Um, that's an accrediting uh, organization that accredits uh, most of the public schools throughout the state. Um, and they do look at both your delivery of education, but also your, the physical uh, conditions of, of the building. So throughout the feasibility process, we tried to gather as much community input, meeting with the school building committee regularly, which are open public meetings, um, but then also getting out into the community. So having tours here, um, we've had a few different um, evenings such as this, um, a very successful one at the um, uh, senior center early on. Um, and that was a great opportunity to try and show those four different options to the community and really gather input on how folks were thinking about them. Um, and it became very clear that uh, the community was not for a base repair option, that they saw numerous challenges with an ad reno approach, um, that they liked the idea of a new, uh, new building um, but wanted to maximize the MSBA grant and keep costs as low as possible um, going forward. 
So after that process, our uh, four options very quickly became, the preferred option was option 3C, as it was called at that time, um, looking at a new school um, on the existing campus, um, trying to place it so that it can be built while the existing school is still in use, so you don't need modular classrooms, you don't have students displaced during the construction process, um, and, and moving that process forward. So um, this small little thumbnail graphic was from long ago, and the design has proceeded uh, considerably since then. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric, and then Jill will follow to look a little bit more at where we are in schematic design now. <coughs> Yeah, so um, we'll get into that in a little more detail. The pool is a separate project from the school project, um, but running concurrently. And so with 5B, that option had the pool, but many other program elements with it. So it was, it was larger than it needed to be just for a pool structure, it's kind of a community structure. But within this option 3C, as we'll see on the site plan here, we are still planning for that, that pool adjacent to the, uh, to the new school. So we mentioned that the campus is 60 plus acres, but a lot of program has to fit in those 60 plus acres, especially with an existing building that's going to stay online during the construction period. So. We want to thank the community because the community has provided a wealth of feedback over the design process and we're listening to you and what we want to do tonight is give you an update on the site plan that we had developed for the previous phase which was the preferred schematic report. What you're looking at here is basically the further refinement of that site plan. So some of the highlights is that uh, we are going to have two separate loops of circulation and I'm just going to point them out here. There's one here and then there's one from the northeast uh, entrance up at Maple Street. The idea is to keep uh, school bus traffic and circulation and passenger vehicle traffic and circulation separate uh, on the new site. Uh, at the main entrance, which is across from Melwood, you'll see that we've consolidated the horseshoe into one entrance and egress opposite Melwood to try to consolidate all the curb cuts there. Uh, we've also provided separate parking areas for students. You can see the larger one to the northeast, that's for students. And then staff visitors would be in the slightly smaller parking lot at the front of the school. Uh, we also have parking to the east. Uh, that would accommodate maintenance staff and also people using the pool building, which is shaded in a different color right here. It's in that like off-white color right there. That's the pool facility. White's the main, the main school building. And also to the west for you know pre-K drop-off, LCAT, IT, uh, district offices. We have parking there that can also service the field. Uh, an extensive athletic field program, we'll get into that in a minute. And there's going to be some extensive uh, amenity spaces around the school, including anywhere from a, the main entrance plaza uh, at the main entrance to the school, uh, an outdoor learning space on the west side. Uh, and an outdoor learning space on the south side and also uh, potential outdoor dining space as well off the south side of the building to take advantage of you know, the solar orientation. Uh, so a lot of amenities, uh, of course we have the existing stadium to the east, that will remain intact, although uh, we're looking at a new concessions building over there and also a new press box uh, with an accessible ramp system to get you up to it. Uh, hard courts, uh, the tennis courts you can see would be displaced so we're currently looking at uh, relocating those to the northeast, and we have made provisions for uh, basketball courts close to the building as well. So that's, that's a bit of an overview, but I'll zero in a little bit more now on, uh, now that, just for reference, uh, that white dashed outline, that's the existing building. So you can see how the proposed site plan fits in with the, with the existing building footprint, and there's phasing logistics and everything that go into to making that happen throughout the construction phase. So, what are some of the amenities that uh, you can expect through this process? Well, we did an inventory of all the athletic fields, and there's numerous ones out there. And so, in effect, what we're doing is giving you that same athletic field program back. Um, some of the highlights, though, is that we're also looking to bring two softball fields to this campus as well. Right now, they're out at Birchland Park. But the idea is to bring softball so that softball and baseball are on the high school property, not, not in separate places. So that's, that's one thing. And, and we're looking at lighting and irrigation upgrades. Um, 
we're going to replace the six tennis courts that you have. Um, there's two basketball courts. The courts themselves would be separately funded, but as part of the project, we're looking at lighting those basketball courts. And then the other fields that we showed you, the multi-sports fields. The only reduction right now is there was a desire by the uh, that we've discussed during a few meetings to permanently fence the varsity baseball and varsity softball. So that's what we're showing right now. In doing so, you would not get a full-size overlay in the outfield like you do currently in the varsity baseball field where there's no permanent fencing. But that's only for part of the year because they put up the, the temporary fencing for baseball season. Uh, so I mentioned uh, a ticketing and concessions building with restrooms and storage. You press box with accessible ramp. Uh, again, separating the, uh, the circulation from school buses and parents to, to make the site flow better. Um, two outdoor classrooms. Right now we're planning on one off the science wing one off, and one off the uh, arts wing. And then an outdoor dining terrace. Um, also a playground for the early education uh, for the kids. And uh, we're looking at a new loading dock that would be properly sized with a full height loading dock and leveler uh, for, the, for, the, for deliveries. Uh, and of course, as we discussed earlier, uh, major accessibility and pedestrian safety upgrades throughout the campus and also extending in from Maple Street, dedicated pedestrian routes from Maple Street and the street crossings into the building itself. And, um, and I don't want this to go, uh, you know, last but certainly not least would be space for summer concerts. Again, you know, the, the first use of this building is a school but this campus is used for the community. And we want you to know we recognize that, we're programming for that, um, so we are going to find space for those, uh, for those treasured community events. And yes, uh, thank you. And um, also the tennis courts will be able to be striped for pickleball. Pickleball's been something that's really grown in popularity. There's a strong desire to bring it, so when you have full-size tennis courts, you can also strike them, uh, strike them for pickleball. Okay, so, um, okay. Question? Just then, when you had the pool separated from the main building, what's the accessibility? The, right now, the pool would be connected um, by a vestibule. It's a separate building, but it would be connected by a vestibule. There would be a community entrance, and like you said, that parking on the west side would not just be for, like, service staff, but it would also be close to the... Uh, pool building while not being right in the bus drop off loop that could lead to problems. So, thank you. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to get into a little bit more detail on the building itself. Um, starting at a high level for anyone who's new to the project, I know I've seen a lot of familiar faces, but we'll go through it again. Um, the building is organized as four wings around a central <coughs> floor. You have the arts wing and the athletics wing, uh, which face towards Maple Street, so the more public-facing part of the school, and the main entrance is at the juncture between those wings. The athletics wing stretches towards the athletic fields, um, towards the turf field, and towards the pool, the pool project. The academic wings are on the south side, they are oriented along an east-west axis to allow for optimal daylighting in the classrooms. They're two stories in height. Um, the idea with bringing them onto the south side of the, the site is to create a connection to the wooded area to the south, so the classrooms are in a quieter and more natural part of the site. The media center serves as the uh, connection point between the academic wings on the second floor. And then on the first floor, you have the cafeteria creating kind of an active student commons along the spine of the building. There's connection points to outside from that cafeteria and in, uh, to the south plaza and then also to the courtyard to the west. So we have made some changes since the last time we presented this to the, to the community. Um, and just to highlight a few of those. Um, probably the largest one is that we've simplified the second floor. Previously, we had had um, some of the district offices and town IT on the second level. We've now moved all of that program to the perimeter of the art swing. So that allows us to eliminate a stair and an elevator and also to really simplify and clarify the um, connection between the district and town office space and the high school. Create separate zones for those. 
We've also been developing our um, admin and guidance suites. We've had conversations with staff there, and these are now located at the front of the building and um, just focusing on trying to make those as accessible and useful to students. We've moved the large group instruction room. It was previously on the south side. We've moved it to be off of the courtyard on the west. The idea here is um, allowing that central spine to be very open and continuous from the front of a building and all the way down to the south. What this slide shows is a summary of the um, floor areas for different spaces within the school. So um, we're looking at both the existing school and the new proposed high school. The existing conditions are listed in the central column and the proposed um, school is on the right hand side. So if you look down at the bottom, you can see the overall square footage comparison between the two buildings, the existing and the new. The new building is roughly the same size of this existing high school. It's about 5,000 square feet larger. Um, but the distribution of spaces within the school is going to be different, and you can see how that breaks out. So core academic spaces, which are your classrooms and labs, the special education classrooms and support service, services, and then your hands-on studios, which are culinary arts and um, the STEM and robotics labs, things like that, all of those spaces are getting larger in the new school. You're having more <laughs> space dedicated to those programs. The biggest reduction we're seeing is in the other category at the bottom. So that includes the um, district offices, the um, town IT, and some of those spaces. But the main difference that you're seeing here is that that no other number in the existing building includes the pool, and it is not included in the new proposed building. So that that uh, existing conditions uh, square footage includes the pool, the, the new one does not. So the school will will be bigger than it is currently. Okay, so by doing a new building, there are all sorts of exciting opportunities with that new design. And at the top of the list are the educational advantages of a new building. We've heard a lot about the challenges that are in this, this existing building with the classrooms not accommodating um, current uh, teaching needs. So with a new school building, you can, you can meet those needs. Uh, what does that mean? It means classrooms that are large enough to accommodate the subject matter being taught. It means new technology and new furniture, flexible furnishings, new finishes, all of this to support um, uh, current teaching um, in those rooms. It means a variety of different spaces available. So in addition to your typical classrooms, we have small group spaces, different breakout spaces to support project-based learning. We also would have that large group instruction room, which is a big enough space for a couple classes to come together, so that could support interdisciplinary projects and learning. So you're offering a wide variety of spaces, the outdoor classrooms as an opportunity. And then overall, through all of that, working with flexibility, creating variety, and helping to create a um, student-centered space that's inclusive for all students and helps all of the students learn. Um, in the, in the building. Another uh, opportunity with the new building is to create a very efficient and sustainable design. The new project is going to be pursuing LEED certif certification. It is also going to be meeting the new Massachusetts Stretch Energy Code. Um, to help meet those ends, we're going to be doing a highly efficient building envelope. So the shell of the building is going to be very high performing. We're looking at all electric HVAC systems as a basis of design. We're also um, looking at including a solar array on the on the rooftop of the new building. I got a question. I know 23 years ago, Birchland was uh, built, but they made a big mistake, and I hope they end doing it. I do consider air conditioning in the high school in the one. We are considering air conditioning. We are planning on air conditioning in the high school at this time. Um, we are going to be having a community uh, sustainable design workshop in Ju on June seventh. It's actually going to be in this room at the high school. Um, so if 
if sustainable design, if build, uh, energy efficiency is something you're interested in and want to uh, participate more in, you should um, plan to come to that, that workshop. Okay, another uh, significant advantage uh, with this new building is that we're going to be incorporating um, security and safety in a holistic way into the building design. Um, that means that as we're developing the, the, the design, um, we'll be keeping in mind things like sight lines and creating spaces that can be easily monitored, uh, maintaining emergency access to all spaces in the, in the building, um, and having, uh, paying attention to controlled access. Um, so who is allowed to get into the building during school day and after hours and having that thoroughly thought out. Um, as we get further into the, into the design process, it, when we get into the construction documents, we start looking at more details like uh, the types of glass and door hardware and security systems. So all of that would come later. Um, what you can see on the, on the right side is the entrance, um, main entrance to the building, our kind of initial concept. You can see there's a series of vestibules um, and uh, several check-in points. So um, in order to get into the building, you're having to be buzzed in through multiple locations, very um, a controlled sequence. Okay, and then um, Eric had touched on a lot of the great site amenities. Uh, there also are a number of community advantages in the, in the building itself. So we're going to have a brand new gym. It's going to be larger with two full courts. Um, there's an alt PE space, which could look something like the, the top image there. That's a space for yoga or dance or fitness classes. There's the new auditorium, which will have all new technology there to support community theater. Um, so a lot of different um, opportunities there and a, a secure community entrance point to the high school and connection to that new pool building. These are some still fairly preliminary massing views of the school building to give you a sense of how it sits on the, on the project site. On this one on the left, we're looking from the south, so you're looking at the two academic wings and then beyond that the arts wing and the athletics wing. If you look on the right side of that um, image, you can see the existing tra track and field with the new tra press box modeled in there and the new concessions buildings with its uh, restrooms shown there. And then on the right side, that image we're looking, if you are kind of floating above Maple Street, looking down, um, so towards the main entrance, towards the uh, gym wing on the left, the arts wing on the right, that main entrance onto the site. Yeah. What's with all the trees? You have to have all those trees in there. <laughs> Do you want to speak to that landscape architect? <laughs> I can say we we'll, 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 it's 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 a, it's for illustrative purposes. The the point being, you have a beautiful you have a beautiful campus that's kind of surrounded by native woodlands and everything, and we're going to work to use landscape as one of the ways to beautify the entrance. But that won't necessarily be the exact location of every tree. That's just. We find it a lot of school bushes ended up getting taken out by plows. So uh, <laughs> these are our our schematic renderings yes. to give a sense for for the project. Sure. Okay. Uh, so just very quickly um, before we get into the the meat of the presentation on the cost. Uh, the pool project update, and we've jumped ahead a little bit. I see there's some questions on that, which is great. Um, so the pool project is running a little bit. I guess it started uh, after the school project, right? So we're a little bit further behind. We have not, with the school project, we've had uh, two, you know, very, very, very high level cost estimates done already. The first one was really just looking at rough. Both of them were looking at very rough dollars per square foot figures. How the market is looking. Um, and again, that's why we're in the schematic design process now, so they can really start evaluating the costs of this specific design. Um, so the pool has unfortunately not had that benefit of, of going through that part, portion of the process. But we have started a pool building committee. Um, we're starting to look at other examples. Um, we're going to do a, a visit to uh, West Springfield um, soon to look at that project, which uh, SMMA was also involved with, um, as was our pool consultant that we're keeping on, on this project here. Um, so it's going to run parallel with the school building project. 
we're hoping we're going to get a cost estimate for the, the pool project at the same time that we get a cost estimate for the high school project, and then both of them will be on the same ballot uh, in November. Um, the committee that, again, we've just started meeting with um, is very interested in community use and student use and expanding both of those. So kind of the, the critical portions that we're looking at is really how this pool building is connected to the high school, but can also function fully um, on its own. So that after hours, uh, the, the pool building can be used, that there's a clear entrance. Um, you don't have uh, visitors kind of wandering the schools of the high school looking for where the pool might be um, or where the locker rooms might be. Um, and at the same time, allowing for easy student use during the day um, so that, that that connection works uh, works quite well. Yeah, so there's going to be two sets of locker rooms, one in the pool building itself and another set of locker rooms by the, by the gym. Um, and the locker rooms by the gym will certainly be oriented towards student use. Um, and then the pool ones will be separate. A lot of that is governed by the plumbing code, um, which is also dependent on the size of the pool. So we have to figure that out first. And then we go into the plumbing code, and then we can start figuring out the size of the lockers and how many fixtures are needed in, in that pool building. The pool's not going to be in the reimbursement program? Correct. Um, and that's going to be made clear on the next slide. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Ben. All right, so up on the screen here is a, um, a summary of the estimated project cost for both the uh, school building project and pool building project. Um, it's important to remember that the numbers up on the screen are taken from estimates that are very early. Um, and as Christian mentioned, um, the estimates will be developed with finer detail at the end of the schematic design uh, phase, which is when the number gets set in stone for the budget. So. Um, that being said, the estimate for the school building project uh, that was performed during the feasibility study earlier this year, um, for that you can see down on the approximate project costs, uh, <clears throat> the estimate was 177, approximately $177 million uh, total project budget for the school project. Um, since a feasibility study was not performed for the pool project, um, it was not professionally estimated in the same fashion that the school project was. Um, instead, our team took data from a similar uh, project, uh, the West Springfield High School uh, pool building that was bid back in 2011. Um, so we took that information from that project and compared it to historical um, escalation data uh, just to come up with what that project would have cost uh, roughly in today's dollars. And what we came up with in that process was that the, uh, the West Springfield uh, project would have cost around $15 million in today's dollars. Now, remember, that's not the, the uh, pool building for this project uh, has not been designed yet. So that's about as fair a comparison as we could have gotten, but that is not an estimate based on actual uh, design drawings. Um, so anyways, the uh, combined <coughs> number at the bottom, uh, or actually all the way to the right, sorry, uh, so combined, uh, the school building and the pool building total $192 million, that's our estimate, and then from that, the expected uh, town share is uh, around $134 million to $138 million. With that, I'd like to welcome up Tom. <laughs> Do you find that those for projected costs oftentimes go over the projected cost because of inflation and the cost of materials? Um, rarely do we. We try to account for that in the estimates themselves, whether, you know, for the escalation, um, there's a certain bit of contingency there, and we um, do always escalate to the midpoint so that, you know, we're not using today's dollars, we're actually using future uh, dollars to account for that uh, margin of the inflation. So, What is our actual reimbursement rate? Right now, for the feasibility study, the reimbursement rate's 56% change. So is that going to hold true for the building as well? Uh, that remains to be determined once, once we get there. But when you look on this slide here, you realize that due to MSBA caps in many different areas, um, the actual rate that you get reimbursed ends up being closer to somewhere between 30% and 35%. But what they tell you is, 
you're being reimbursed at 56.4 percent. Is that right? Yeah. 56.4 percent. I don't want to be redundant, but can you explain caps? Sure. Um, you want yeah, so there are um, within the uh, within the MSBA guidelines for the project budget. A lot of it is geared towards a lot of the eligibility of things that get full maximum eligibility are things that tie directly to the educational component of why we're all here for this project, right? Um, within that, you know, an MSBA, they only have so much money allotted that they need to divvy up between all of the projects throughout the state. And so with that, they could not ever really reimburse, you know, 100% or even 80% of that. Um, so they do need to stipulate kind of caps uh, within that um, budget. And for instance, uh, the site uh, cost cap is the biggest one. Um, it, forever it was 8% of the construction cost is all they would uh, reimburse up to. They just recently increased it. Uh, Christian, help me out. Do you remember what it's? I think it's 10% now. So they, they've upped it a little bit um, because of these spikes in, in costs. Um, but you know, within the budget, there are you know restrictions to you can't go over the site costs. You can't uh, you can only spend so much money on uh, furniture, or fixtures, and equipment for the students. Um, they try to kind of control the costs as much as they can, so that they can be fair to other communities and participate in as many of these as they can. Do they cap the size of the building based upon the enrollment of the building? They cap the size of the building yes. 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 Huh? You want me to drum roll it? <laughs> yeah. Well, without further ado, then. Before you go there, I'm just curious. The MSBA, did they cap the reimbursement or the per square foot cost? Yes. Yes. And what is that through the MSBA? So eligible. So they cap it at what? Five hundred fifty dollars a square. Sorry. Um. Oh, way off. Um. Three hundred ninety-three. Three ninety-three. I don't know where that number just came from. I apologize about that. Let's grab that. Um, three hundred ninety-three dollars a square foot of the construction costs. And right at the moment, if this goes through, based on these numbers, what are we looking at a per square foot cost? So for the for the estimates we had for the for the building project uh, was I think it was seven hundred and seventy dollars a square foot for construction costs. Um, obviously, we haven't gone through the whole information for her. We haven't got the information for the pool yet, but. There'll be a slide and two slides that helps illustrate this very concept. I'm a little worried. <laughs> <laughs> <Great. laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Tom Christensen, and uh, yep, I've got the slide. Uh, <clears throat> so based on our estimated, I notice everybody keeps slamming that word in your face. We don't have the numbers. These are all, everything's estimated. Um, we've got some, some assumptions here for uh, a, an average assessed single family home value of $339,811. Um, the, the school project's gonna cost between 120 to 122 million. Um, tax rate impact per thousand, somewhere between $2.90 and $3.20 a year, which turns out to be around $900 and ninety dollars to a thousand and eighty-five dollars a year. Um, for the average, yeah. Which was three? Did you say three sixty? Three thirty-nine eight eleven. That's for fiscal twenty-three. The average. Uh, the pool. Pool project somewhere around fifteen million, like you said, um, about forty cents a year uh, per thousand dollars assessed value. Uh, for an estimated tax impact on the average single family home of $135 a year. So the combined total being somewhere between $1,125 and $1,220 a year based on your average assessed single family home value for fiscal 23. Um, that's a 30 year loan, 5%. Obviously it can be broken out uh, more than a few different ways, uh, but these are all sort of <coughs> estimated things we don't know for sure. Uh, just to get a number, uh, we've had, uh, this is Forum 4 now. Uh, the most popular question obviously was, what's this going to cost us? This is our first estimate of what that's going to cost. Again, like Ben said, 
we don't know where the cost of the building is going to go. Um, so this is sort of ballpark uh, what our estimated tax impact will be for a new high school. Phil? Could you come up with an estimate with the cost of, of money involved in that estimate, with the impact of four or five percent tax on the percent Well, we, because, because we didn't have a, a exact number, we didn't run all the scenarios. It's just a rough guess. So, for instance, I think a couple months ago we ran a 20-year note, yeah. and it was probably another 150 to 200 dollars a year for the just the school. We have like again the the pool just kind of started, so. Um, but if that 30 was a 20, we'd end up with just the school portion, another 150 to 200 dollars a year per household. Well, like I said, that was a couple months ago again, and we just ran the numbers quick. There's really no reason to... to Can you give us a good, a, a rough estimate of what the reserve is in this 177 uh, average that you're using, that the, the estimators use as a guideline? To some degree, that 177... The price of the building? Yeah, the building. How much reserve is in those numbers? Contingency. Roughly, contingency. Is it 20? How much? 29. 29. Okay, that's what I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So, I mean, in looking at that, and, and just doing a little quick math, it comes like to $136 million in interest alone over 30 years to the town. And the average one of us over 30 years is going to be paying about $36,000 towards this. Like their numbers. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, if that. I don't like I said I don't have that arithmetic, but th these are this is the numbers for the price of the school. It is a big number. Percent increase about in our taxes, which doesn't include the two and a half percent we go up every year. So if everything goes as planned, and we don't get extra costs from lack of skilled labor out there or inflation of materials, we're looking at about a twenty percent increase in taxes every year. That, that's looking like the number, but again. Well, no, no, that, but I understand that's the number. But based on that number, that's, you know, with some quick math, that's what I'm coming yeah, up yeah. with. Yeah. I mean, if everybody wants it, they want it, but it, we're, our taxes are going to go up about 20%. Right. So yeah. the, 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 the amount of money that we got to pay for either a new school or to fix the old one is going to be... Well, when they say that, they say it's $150 million, but nobody shows us how that is. That it's, and I, I mean, it's a very... You know, I, they keep saying the school is that it's at the end of its usable life. Now, we learned tonight that it has good bones when we took the tour. In fact, fantastic bones. But I was forced to go to Wilbraham Princeton Academy for a year. I hated it there. But Wilbraham Princeton Academy, that you see from the road, was built between 1825 and 1867. And to go there today, it costs between twenty-five and $66,000 a year. So clearly, the people that send their children there aren't going I'm for Gobbin and I am the chair of the swimming pool committee because um, I'm the town swim coach. Um, but ab above that, <laughs> um, I actually work at Wilbraham Munson Academy. I'm a math teacher there. <laughs> so I can tell you when they are making improvements to their buildings, they are getting mega donations <laughs> from from alumni and grants and people who were on the board. So the money, like they just built a brand new Athenaeum on their school. It was $5 million or somewhere between that, I think. All of it was donated. So you're talking about people who are giving back to that school specifically for that. And if you look at some of the bones, yes, yeah, some of the bones and those buildings are great. There's still a lot of improvement needs to be done there too. I wanted to ask the question, if, if we didn't vote for the, for the school, what would be the increase in our taxes if we had to make all the improvements to get the pool or the school up to code just with mechanical, HVAC, right. all the stuff that needs to be done to make it usable and safe for our children to go here? That's what my other question is. What's the comparable between that and what we would have to pay anyway to get it to our needs? So it looks like we have our uh, big question for next forum. Um, <laughs> but it's a good point. We're going to be spending a lot of money no matter what.
I just want to, is, we, we have not run the tax impact, but I wanted to quickly, because we did go over this kind of quickly here. So um, the tricky part about the option one, base repair, is that we're really not sure how much reimbursement you would get from the MSBA for that type of project, right? The MSBA wants to see public funding spent for education that's going to last for the next 50 years. So they're not going to spend a lot of money for schools that have undersized classrooms, that have spaces that they do not deem adequate for the next 50 years. So we tried over and over, because they do have repair programs, so they will, you know, sometimes but for windows and, and, and roofs and doors, which uh, the district has already been um, utilizing to a, to a great extent. Um, we tried to get an understanding for that estimated grant number, but we can't, just can't get one from the state. So we've made an estimate on another slide of uh, 90 to 120 million would be the local share. So while we have a local share for the school for option 2C of between 120 to 125 million, that would decrease for that base repair option to about 90 to 120. Still in a similar ballpark. We haven't run the tax numbers on that, but it, it helps give you a sense of, you know, it's not it's not free or the new school, it's, it's something in between. Just a comment saying there's still a lot of concerns with fire sprinklers. To accessibility for safety, I know the town, the town committees have done an, an amazing job trying to keep this building safe. But my kids have been in this high school with with rain coming down on their heads, and is it is it wise for us to keep putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into a roof for a building that is that is falling apart at the seams? They're working really hard, the people who take care of our buildings. But we're still going to get an increase in our taxes just by trying to fix these broken pieces. It doesn't increase the size of the classrooms or the accessibility for kids who have special needs or a lot of the electrical and fire hazards that are existing at this time. It would actually decrease the size of the classrooms. Yeah. Okay, and just if I could add something. Uh, as Christian was saying, these are our two columns we're looking at. Either this one. Or is this one? Now we spend 100, 100, 1.5 million on an annual basis, townwide, for capital investments on a yearly basis. I don't know how we're going to do that. That's unachievable. This is our one shot at MSBA funding right now. This is our shot. And this is what the committee's come up with. And it'll be beautiful for this town. It's a lot of money, and we've been working so hard to get that dollar amount down because we understand the impact to the taxpayer. We know this is a big hit. These are the costs we're faced with. If we were able to build it five years ago, we would have been much better off. This is when MSBA invited us into the process. So we've done the analysis. I pushed hard to get this somewhere because I believe in trying to get there, but we can't. That gives us smaller rooms, meaning we'll have to put the um, ductwork inside the rooms and then build smaller rooms inside of those. And it gets us an old building for the same money, and again, I can't stress this enough. 90 million at a million point five a year, do the math. 60 years we're going to do all this stuff? It's just, it's impossible. We have no other option. Do you have another option for me, Ralph? So if we're going to go with base repair because this doesn't pass, and that's, I mean, let's face it, that's what we're trying to do is in November get a vote for this to pass. But if it doesn't pass, we're, we're going to be stuck with repairing. MSBA is not going to invite us back in. So what we're going to be looking at is an immediate vote as quick as we can to do some type of a debt exclusion for a certain amount to get the new roof on, to get that repaired, to get the electrical upgraded. It, it's not going to be done over 60 years with a million dollars right. a year. We're still going to yeah. have to do some type of a debt exclusion. But again, because we're going to be operating basically July and August that the repairs will be done, you're probably looking at that exclusion of $40 million up front so that you can start getting the roof and this and that. And just as soon as you get the roofing all done, you're going to have to go for another debt exclusion to do right. more. So just to repeat on the microphone, because I know the president, uh, Ralph Page, the president of the council, 
referring to how we would have to fund it if not for. And so we would have to go back out for a vote for $40 million potentially to do the roof, some of the electrical right away, um, which again, what's the plausibility of passing that if we don't pass this? Right? So, yeah. No, we're not shown. We're shown a number of $120 million, and we're not shown how we get there. Yeah. I've heard the roof is $6 million. I don't doubt that. It's but we don't see what all these other numbers are, how it all adds up to that, and over how many years it has to be done. Sure. Probably half the buildings in this city, my house is over 60 years old. I mean, and I know it's not a commercial building. I'm not trying to, that, that it's a commercial building. But we're not showing how we get there. And all these plants and whatnot that are here, that operate in buildings that are 60 years or older, seem to do it. And the other hit that we're going to take on this is that businesses who don't have kids in school are going to get stuck with this. And a lot of them are going to move out of here or not come here. And that's going to put a bigger burden on the homeowners. Yeah. No, it's real. It's real. Yeah, one more question. Then we're going to try to get to the slides, but I know you had to hear them. We'll get to the rest of the slides, and then we'll come back. Go ahead. One of the big issues is what's the impact to me as a homeowner thousand dollars a year twelve hundred a year something like that right since you guys are going to calculate what the tax impact of the 120 million dollar base repair is while you're doing that analysis can you do an analysis of how much value i'm going to lose in my house by not having a good school here because the thirty six thousand dollars i'm going to spend in taxes for the next 30 years is going to Am I going to lose that 36 in the value of my house? Yes. Mm -hmm. True. Agreed. Yeah, no, there's a reality of the fact that um, folks looking to buy in Western Mass, if you have a family, if, if you have children, you're looking at the schools and you're looking specifically at the flagship. And, you know, we don't have what surrounding towns have. So, Correct. yes, good point. Can we just get back? Can we just get back? We have like four slides. We want to get questions at the end. Do you mind if we just finish off? Please. <laughs> I don't doubt the estimates and what we need for, for the schools. And, and I, I don't know of anybody that would say that we don't need it, per se. What I would like to see is some plan of how do we generate revenue to be able to afford this and be able to present to the taxpayers, hey, yeah, we, we, we got this, but we need more revenue in this town to cover expenses like that. That's what this gentleman's over here saying. So, let, for, so for example, I realize what's your you're example? not committee, but we need leadership in the sense of saying, hey, I don't need five dollars every thousand dollars, thousand dollars worth of home value, but but this is what our plan is overall. Am I going to take a five percent cut across the board on all other department budgets along with this? I need some type of plan that's going to address the revenue side of the town. Because our expenses are not decreasing. That's a fact. They're not going to decrease. We're, we're going to be going through a recession. Never mind inflation that we've been experiencing. And it's not going to be just one year. It's going to be for a while. But we do need a high school to some degree. And, and probably other things. So we got to look at other than expenses. We're going to have a revenue plan in this town to cover things like this. It, it's, just, it's just not feasible the run on, well, we're just going to increase the property taxes. Because as you well know, we have a cap. And when you start putting the $5 on the $19, we're at the $24 cap. And what is it, 2.5%, $25 a thousand? So if you're talking $5 increase, we're there. So we got we got to think about how do we generate more revenue. It can't be just a property tax owner. So I like to see some committee put together to say how are we going to generate more revenue in the future, a different committee. other than just like a committee to address the school building. Okay. Okay. We're gonna thank you. We're gonna go through the rest of the slides, and then we will we will certainly get to people's questions. Thank you so much. So <clears throat> the team is well aware, um, you know, that these projected costs can come off, you know, they're, they're a bit staggering, right, to everybody. 
Um, and we thought it would be helpful to show this graphic, which helps explain, doesn't explain everything, um, but I think it helps explain the main driving uh, factors behind why our projected costs are as high as they are. Um, so the graphic is based on actual <coughs> and projected bid data from um, 179 uh, MSBA projects over the past 15 years. And the orange line in the middle depicts the average um, new uh, construction, uh, sorry, the average cost of new construction, new school construction that is. And you can see in the past 10 years, so if you're looking down at the bottom, it's a little tough to see, but from the beginning of 2014 to where we are at now, um, it's more than doubled. From $330 uh, dollars a square foot roughly back in 2014 to about $770 a square foot uh, now where we're at, that's actually where uh, Esau Meadow High School's uh, estimate came in at 770 a square foot. Um, so much of this spike, as we've talked about, um, is due to the, the rapid increase in costs, uh, labor costs, um, supply chain disruptions have added to that, and then just in general material costs have been increasing to keep pace with the inflation. Um, so we thought that it would be important just to show this to you, because um, it kind of does fall into that same, the cost of doing nothing bucket. Um, because what all this information eventually leads to um, when MSBA does analyze the data of, you know, the rapid rise in construction costs, uh, you know, they only have a certain amount of a lot of money that they need to, you know, like I said, divvy up between uh, all of the uh, towns throughout the Commonwealth. That likely, if you have sky-high <laughs> construction costs, um, it likely means that they're going to either participate less in projects or participate in less projects in general. There will be less projects being uh, greenlit from the uh, state. So it, it just it reinforces the, um, the importance of, of an approved project vote uh, just from a standpoint of maintaining uh, eligibility for any kind of grant reimbursement for the project from the state. Um, we've talked through some of the other factors that would limit the project should uh, it fall out of this program. Uh, it is a, a long, steep climb to get back to, um, to where we are at today. So just found it important. I know it doesn't answer everything, all the questions here tonight. They're all very valid, uh, but we just thought this would be important to show you, you all tonight. So I'm just going to very quickly go through kind of where we go from here, and then we can head back to its questions, and I'm sure we'll get back to slides like this and, and the previous two. But um, again, we're in the middle of schematic design. Um, at the end of this process, we submit uh, to the state um, in late August, is that right now, I think? And so this is kind of the deliverables that we're looking at. Um, looking at, we get two independent cost estimates, um, one from the owner's project manager, one from the design team. We reconcile those estimates. Again, those estimators are taking factors like escalation and market conditions into account. And that's used, and, and we've got it in orange here, the Project Scope and Budget Agreement. And that's a really critical document with the MSBA because that sets the, the budget for the project from here on out. So even you know, if this project passes in November, we have another year of doing construction documents and really getting into the fine details. Throughout that process, we still need to match that same project budget that's set at the end of schematic design. Um, we also look, we work with uh, the DESE, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, they're looking at special education sizes. They're looking at um, some of our um, spaces within the high school um, safety and things of that nature. Um, we have both a, a specifications, a document of specifications, as well as drawings. And we'll have a big, thick stack of very large drawings, um, again, to really help those cost estimators um, get to a, a more refined number than what we've seen tonight. Um, that project budget includes things like furniture, it includes things like technology. Um, we also have things on here, life cycle cost analysis. So when we're evaluating our mechanical systems, we're looking at a life cycle cost analysis to make sure that we are um, getting the community um, the most efficient system um, over the length of the, of the project. Um, so again, looking at a very simplified version of the timeline, um, here we are in schematic design. Um, we'll submit that to the MSBA. We're looking for approval at their board meeting in October, um, and then looking for approval from the local vote in November. And then if that goes forward, then we go into design. Um, the building committee has elected to go with a construction manager at risk. 
Um, what that does is it allows the contractor to become involved much earlier in the process. So we're able to choose which contractor we want to work with instead of just taking the lowest qualified bidder. Um, and with that um, involvement early in the design process, um, it's helpful for things looking at construction costs. It's helpful for looking at things like early packages so you can get the project started sooner. With being able to get the project started sooner, we're looking at that occupancy date that Ben mentioned at the beginning of August of 2026, and that date simply would not be possible without going with this uh, construction manager at risk approach. Um, and then as Ben mentioned, some more um, you know, demolition and site work uh, with closeout um, in 2027. I just wanted to emphasize, so we'll get that uh, cost estimate at the end of schematic design with that um, green triangle there. We go through three more cost estimates during uh, the development of the document. So we'll do one at the end of design development, one at 60% construction documents, and another one at 90% construction documents. Again, each one of those is to check back in with that price that was set at the project scope and budget and make sure that the, con that the project is still tracking, um, that we're still staying on budget, um, and, and it'll, it gives us time to adjust the design accordingly. Um, so that's, that's a really helpful way to keep uh, the project so, so that we have no surprises uh, later on. Um, in terms of uh, learning more and future involvement, again, as Jill mentioned, we have the uh, sustainability charrette on June 7th. Um, so if you're interested in that, please do, please do attend. We're looking for input from students. We're looking for input from the community. Um, we have a, a website um, that's extremely helpful. It's got a lot of great links on there, including to past agendas and, and minutes from the uh, building committee meeting. Um, building committee meetings are public, um, so uh, welcome folks to attend those. And then we do have this uh, email address, ELHS Building Project at eastlongmeadowmass.gov um, for any questions. We have been getting a few questions in from that uh, email address. It's been really helpful, and we've been able to, to address most of those. What time on the 7th? 2.30 to 4.30. Yes, it's a little bit early. 2.30 to 4.30, and that's so that we can get student involvement. So that's why we orchestrated that a little bit earlier than, than this one. Okay, with that, should we open it back up to questions? Are the um, reports and things that were used to generate the numbers in here available on that website as publicly accessible documents? I don't know if they are, right? They should, they will be. Um, and that we can get to your question, sir, on the, on the cost of, to what generated that number for the base repair option. Um, that's all included in those, um, in those reports that were submitted to the state. We were talking to roofs earlier. With the new school, what's the life expectancy of the roof on the new school? And you're talking with good maintenance. If it's taken care of, how long can we expect that to last? Backing up with the membrane, the membrane, membrane roofing. How long will this roof on the new school? So, I would say typically, typically it's 30 like a 30 year, year, yeah, 25 to 30 year warranty depending on the mill thickness of the, the roof. You said warranty. You said warranty. Yeah, that's, but, that's oh, the okay. warranty. I don't want to okay. take a guess at, I mean, look around, but we probably got, how old is this? Uh, 25 years? Like this roof? Yeah, yeah early 90s this uh, roof was put on. And the warranty, warranty for, the warranty for one part of this roof was 15 years. That's the section that we just replaced. And the other part of the roof, the, the majority of the roof was a 25 year warranty? Yes. Yeah. And that was, uh, these roofs were put on roughly in the early 90s. With all the other school buildings as well. Thank you. Not Meadowbrook. Meadowbrook's got a new roof. Yeah. Go ahead. I want to go back to the, the issue of the taxes. So you showed that the individual homeowner may see their taxes increase nine hundred to a thousand dollars. I should probably identify who I am because then people will know how, why I know that doesn't happen. So my name is Paul Gagliaducci. I was a superintendent of school in Hamden, Wilbraham when New Minichard was built. I also was a superintendent in Summers, Connecticut when the Summers Complex was built. And the same, we had the same thing. Uh, same proposals, the same presentations, this is all very similar to me. And in no way did the taxpayer, and by the way, I lived in both of those towns because that was my contract. So I not only 
had new high schools built, new projects built, but I also was a taxpayer. And my taxes never went up 20%. Because there's many things involved, and you people need to make that known to the public. Is the town of, Whoop, is the town of East Long Meadow retiring any current bonds? What impact will that have to do on the new project? So if you retire three or four bonds that you currently have, the new project then takes over that same amount of money that I'm already paying in my taxes. And, and that's what you need to tell people. Also, if the property values go up, that makes a big difference in terms of what it is. So even though I've heard the same arguments over and over again, I've never been lived in a town that's built new schools that's seen a 20% increase in its taxes. It just doesn't happen. Uh, no matter what the project is. If you people have ever driven and gone to the complex in Summers, Connecticut, by the way, I am an East Long Meadow resident now. I live over on Fields Drive in East Long Meadow. I've been here for a year and a half. I have two grandchildren here at the high school, one graduating this June and one who's a uh, sophomore. Uh, they won't see this. Um, so where was I? So if you see it, Summers, Connecticut, you see a pretty nice complex. 1989, that 1990, that complex was built. $21 million. $21 million. What was the cost of Minichog? Minichog? We had that. No. Uh, <coughs> Minichog was more than that. And I also, by the way, I also was hired by the Diocese of Springfield, so I was the guy in charge of building Pope Francis High School. So I've had some experience in building schools. Um, and I can tell you that all of the information that these people have generated is spot on, is spot on. The one thing I would say is you really need to get, get back into your books and make sure people don't get too excited about the fact that they think that their, their home taxes are going to increase 20%. It just doesn't happen. There's too many factors. And by the way, when you vote, it takes three to four years for that tax, for that school project to start kicking into your taxes because it's how it's bonded, it's how that money takes, takes in place over the next three to five years once you vote for the project. And does this, is this school, when I walk this, the building in this school, I've been in a lot of buildings that are 60 years old. This is no different than everybody else. If you remember, probably, if you know anybody, who was, went to school in East Long Meadow in the 50s, they probably went to Springfield. And then when the baby boomers came in, Springfield kicked everybody out. They kicked all the kids out from Wolverham. They kicked all the kids out from Hamden. They kicked all the kids out from, and they even kicked kids out from Summers, Connecticut, who were going to school in Springfield. And who built schools? East Long Meadow, Wolverham, Long Meadow. Everybody built schools in the 60s. And wear and tear of 500 to 1,000 kids every single day buildings don't make it it's not like you would think a regular building is a lot of people have used this building over the 60 years it's been here and you've added on the same years that everybody else added on so you have three there's two additions to this building if you go back to Minichog, two additions to that building if you go over to if you go over to west springfield two additions to that building by the way i'm a little hurt that you didn't mention Minichog in your presentation. <laughs> you only picked on West Side, West Side and uh, Long Meadow. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. But we were part of the we were part of the school uh, the school building program after they had done a moratorium. They stopped, by the way. I don't know if you people know that they stopped in the early 2000s. They would not support any school building because they were so much in debt. And so what they did was they got their they got themselves in order, and then they came up with a model school building project. And we were the third school in the state that was chosen as a model school. We picked a school from Whitman Hanson High School down in the eastern part of the state. Minichog looks very much like that school, um, and that's how we saved some money. I don't know how it is now, Gordon, but uh, but the bottom line is, I think you're doing a great job. I don't think the taxpayer is going to see that amount of money on their taxes. It just doesn't happen. And, but I think you need to be more specific. I know you can't make promises, but you need to talk about the issues. And you did list five bullets that are there, and I think those are important. But I think the fact that the, the town really has to take a look at what it offers in terms of are we retiring bonds, 
what's this really going to ask? Add? And what what else is happening? You know, I've lived in the town of Hamden 20 years. I lived in Summers, Connecticut 15 years. Your tax base in East Long Meadow is so much better than either one of those towns. What is there, two industries in the town of Hamden? And those people voted for a new high school. Look at what you have. You just voted a new warehouse on the street that I live on. <laughs> you know? You know, so Which one's I, that? The, the, the bottom line is you, you have a really good tax base in this town, you should be able to afford a new high school. That's, and that's fair. And excellent points. And I think this was our first blush at getting some information to people. And in, in all honesty, it's budget season, and this was just the number that came out. We haven't. This number is going to keep changing. The variables are all going to change, all the ones you mentioned, those and are, more. Those are really important. And they're important. And by the time November comes, this, this, our pencils will be sharpened, and we'll, we'll know where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Go ahead, Christian. You run points. Sir. My question is to what Paul just talked about. Why are we not, two things, why are we not using a model school building from, that's already been designed and built in other parts of the state, number one. Number two, I've worked with Skanska before out in Seattle on a $200 million uh, addition to a major hotel in downtown Seattle. I'm asking you, sir, are you, you work for all the people in this room, correct? Yes. What value engineering have you already started doing on that design up there? Two questions, the model building and the value engineering. I'm going to go first. Yeah. Building or yeah. go first? We don't have a design yet. What are you going to value engineer? I'll do the model building first. What are those elevations of? They're rendering. They're not going to understand. Yeah. Someone had to put that elevation together. Fair enough, but they haven't gone through schematic yet. They just got done describing that. I'm not sure what you would value engineer without a. Well, why don't we let why don't we let the the, uh, the town's representative answer that question? I think to piggyback on Steve's point, it would ultimately, a lot of the value engineering that we see on projects at this stage do, does come in schematic design uh, that wouldn't have come in feasibility when we're still, you know, weighing all the options, analyzing several different uh, project solutions. Um, it wasn't up until, you know, several months ago that we knew exactly what this project was going to be um, as far as the plan. So now we start to build out schematic design. Um, we know that we need to meet the budget. So there will be things that we'll take a, a good hard look at and consider, you know, with the committee, um, you know, removing as far as a... You, your elevations show a two-story building? That is not my elevation. Someone's... Who's the architect up here? Two-story <laughs> building? What's that? Two-story building? There. Correct. Is three stories not doable, or is it doable? There's kind of diminishing returns on... on uh, well, there's a variety of factors that really wrap into that. I, it all kind of works together, right? So through the programming meetings with the school and figuring out exactly how we want the classroom layout and the school to feel, it worked out well to have four different classroom wings. And so those stack very well as a two-story building. Um, accessibility in terms of utilizing an elevator as little as possible, having students use the stairs as much as possible, we found that two-story schools are much more successful than three- or four-story schools. We sometimes do it when we're on like a very constrained site um, we've done a four-story middle school, but um, it's much easier and in some ways more efficient to go with a, with a two-story building in that way. I'd say in terms of your question on value engineering, at this early stage in the process, the best thing we can do right now is really looking at square footage. And that's where we spend a lot of our time at the initial feasibility study of looking at that square footage very carefully because that's where you can have the biggest bang for your buck, right? So yes, you can change your flooring from something nice to something not so nice and save a little bit of money. But if you can, if you can cut square footage from the building, <coughs> so you can have a much bigger impact. So we've had a lot of discussions with the school building committee, a lot of discussions with the MSBA, making sure that all of our spaces are tailored to what the school needs and not overextending um, in terms of the square footage. So we, we didn't get the answer on the model building. Yeah, so that was a very um, popular program when the MSBA started back up again after the moratorium is much less popular these days because it has not shown to have much of a cost savings. Some of the projects have had a little bit of a timeline savings. You can get there a little bit faster because it's been done before. 
Um, but most districts, they choose early on whether they want to go model school or not, and most districts are choosing to have a school tailored to their specific district, which is exactly why we went through that whole feasibility study, talking to the staff, really understanding the needs specifically for East Long Meadow. I liked you. I said two. I actually have one last question, then I'll leave. Okay? No. I own a business. I, I'm, I'm in and out of residential properties, commercial properties. Can't find anyone who wants to work. When I was a student at the other town next door, we had shop classes. I know there's a place in Chicopee at the Air Force Base and blah, 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 blah. And I know it's not cool to teach in a suburban community young people, males, females, whoever they are, about industrial arts, metal, wood, mechanics, anything like that. You want to put a lab, this is for you, superintendent, mm -hmm. you've got a robotics lab in there. Well, the AI is going to develop the robots of the future anyway. We still need all those people who are willing to get a little dirt under their fingernails. Is it not valuable to put that space into a $200 million building? It's actually, uh, it's, I don't know if it's cost effective because right now we're a member of the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative. It's not out at Chicopee anymore. It's actually located in West Springfield um, at Brush Hill. And our enrollment there is increasing to the point I think you're making. Um, our students are entering um, into the different vocational programs that they have over there now starting in ninth grade. Um, and their enrollment has increased considerably over the last two years. Um, and so you have seven districts um, spending money and making sure that those programs are effective um, over at Lower Pioneer Valley. So that's where our vocational programming is. Robotics is something separate. It's not considered a vocational program by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but it is something that we pursue here. Um, additionally, to the robotics program. A number of years ago, we applied for the Project Lead the Way grant, which um, increases our math and engineering courses. Um, and that's something that our students are enrolling in more and more. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes. Uh, it's not a question. Um, my name is Carolyn Farros, and I am the president of the Citizens for East Long Meadow High School, also known as Vote Yes ELHS. Um, and I just wanted to say hello and let you know who I am. And if uh, anybody is interested, we are currently looking for people to help us on our committee and um, for campaigning. Um, we are going to take names, phone numbers, and emails if anybody wants to talk afterwards. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to say one really quick thing. I don't, don't want to argue with anything you said, but the 20% isn't my number, it's your number, and it's up there, and it's over 18% just for that, not including our regular two and a half we get every year. And that number may change, but based on how you see these things go, they rarely go down, they normally go up. And so if we do, if people want to do it, do it. But understand that taxes are going to go up by about 20%. And that's based on his numbers, not, not mine. That's up there. Right. No, you're right. And uh, as uh, Mr. Christensen said, this is our, our first run at this. But um, there's a lot of history that uh, we can start to access now and do a better job of breaking this out for you as we continue with our public forums. Like that, it's, it's all there. Correct. But. We also can build on the history of what actually happens as new schools are built. Gordon, just had a quick question. Sure. Our uh, newest school is Birchland. Right. Um, do we years know old. what the, the length of um, the note was on that? Was that a 20 year or was that a 30 year? Uh, 20. Was it 20? 20. Yeah. It was a 20 so, year, wasn't it? Was done. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I think that Last it's already come off of um, tax rolls. So. I know the amount of debt that we're carrying right now is, is lower, which is a good thing mm -hmm. based on if we're going through it in these schools. So. Right. Yeah, but this bypass is two and a half when we do this. That's what it's for, so we don't have to figure out how to fix the school within budget. So I assume that when this ends or when the other schools end, even though that money comes off, 
it doesn't come off of the budget, so our taxes don't go down when these bonds are paid off. Because I've never seen my taxes go down because the bonds are paid off. It's a debt, it's a debt exclusion. Debt exclusion. Yeah. So it'll be, it'll be a 30-year bond on a debt exclusion, so it's, a, it's, it's different than the two and a half. So it will come off, as did Birchland, in 30 years. God, I wish I would have been here to see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Go ahead. Has the town put money aside for this? How much is the town putting into this? How much have we accumulated for this project? Yeah, so every year the town funds the operating budget, and what's left over at the end of the year, and I'm speaking in general terms, we have in free cash and um, what's the other one? Stabilization. And then the next year we start the process over again. So there is no bank account for this for this time. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Fraschilla. Didn't somebody say earlier that if we had done this a few years ago, we would have gotten more money back? We've lost money because we have not. The cost would be per less. square foot would have been right. less. I thought there was also a reimbursement, a lesser, a lesser reimbursement, no? So a reimbursement currently from MSBA, Massachusetts School Building Authority, 56% roughly. Um, but our, our effective rate, so what they'll actually reimburse us for out of the whole project, ends up to be 30, 32%. Okay. So that's that difference. So that's the real percentage. And yeah. The reason that I bring it up is 30 years ago, when my oldest son was in this school, we had the same meetings in the auditorium, and we had the same procrastination, for lack of a better word. When you look at the numbers, no matter how that affects our tax rate, it seems like it's going to cost us almost as much to fix it as opposed to get a, a new one. To me, there's no option. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about the NIAS. Um, level and I'm yeah giving this award and so I as I said I work at Wilbraham Hamilton Academy we just went through the whole accreditation process as a whole school it's a fun and process. I don't know if people are familiar with what that is sure. and what it means and where our high school is currently at because I know it was spoken so about before and I think that would be important for people to know what it is and what that means. And so it's a great question. So NEASC is the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. It's the organization that accredits our educational program here at East Long Meadow High School along with any number of um, school districts across the Commonwealth and, and across New England. Basically it's a 10 year cycle. There are seven standards that um, the group looks at any school district or any educational program on. One of those standards is community resources. Within that standard is the building the technology that's provided, um, basically all the resources the community provides to make education run for the students of that um, school district. So in 2014, when the visiting team came out and looked at all of our programming, our daily operation, they come out, they come as a team, and they visit with you for three days, and they go through everything you do as a school. Then they generate a report. On that report, there are a number of accommodations. We did receive a number of accommodations, and there are always a number of recommendations. The um, area for community resources, we were placed on warning status. Since 2014, we've done a number of progress reports. We've hit a number of their recommendations. You saw some of the capital projects we've done here. Uh, the biggest thing that moved us forward was going to a one-to-one -one program with technology and Chromebooks. Thank you to the town council for supporting that and the school committee to, for supporting that. That actually um, moved us through the whole COVID pandemic incredibly well. Um, that was something that was significant in keeping us just on a warning status for community resources uh, with some of our latest progress reports. And what they will look at next, they uh, look on this MSBA feasibility study that we're doing incredibly favorably. And so that's the um, commendation that we've received most recently in terms of our status with the NESC. But it's for community resources. So we do have accreditation currently. We're on warning status for community resources. Um, and we're still on warning status, even with the um, advance of the one-to-one -one program. 
why is the state only reimbursing 34%? That's a great question. <laughs> I mean, is there they'll say, wrong they'll say that they're reimbursing us 56% in change. And actually, I do want to back up a little bit because I think it gets lost in all of this as we're looking at the cost for construction. We're in a feasibility study right now. Um, we have a design team. We have an owner project manager. We're spending money right now, and we have a <laughs> partnership with the Mass School Building Authority right now where we're spending close to or over a million dollars, and they're reimbursing us along the way. So I don't want to minimize that partnership. We wouldn't be able to do this study without that partnership. Um, and we're getting more of the 56% in the feasibility study than we would in construction because, as we talked earlier, they have many more caps throughout <coughs> the construction process. Um, but basically it comes down to where they cap um, what they're going to reimburse, if that makes sense. So one of the one of the easiest examples is square footage. They cap it at what we say 390, 393 a square foot um, for construction costs. But we know our estimate right now is somewhere around 700 a square foot for construction costs. And so that's where your 56 percent starts to drop to the 30 to 35 percent. Gorgeous. Yeah, please. The green line down here is the MSBA, what they will reimburse at per dollar per square foot. So you can see back in 2009, they were basically reimbursing what the average cost of construction was at that time. So then if you were getting 56%, you would get 56%. Over time, the construction costs have increased, but the MSBA construction funding limit has not kept pace. So you can see even when Worcester did their program, right, the MSBA was covering this much, this much was on the town. And that jump is just not keeping up. And so that's why your 56% becomes a 33%. Can I also just want to quickly mention, the MSBA is moratorium on their like, special summer quick fixes for moving yeah, Accelerated repair, which was yeah. mentioned earlier, we participated in two programs with Accelerated Repair. The Accelerated Repair program is just that. It's a program that they try to expedite. We saw how long it took us to get into their core program, which we're in right now. Um, accelerated Repair has right now been put on hiatus because they're dealing with the incredible spike in construction costs. So they're not accepting Accelerated Repair applications at the moment. Right. You want to stay in it? Yeah. At least that's my opinion. In the back. Yes? Just, just to touch base on the accreditation thing you were just talking about. What happens if we lose accreditation? What does that actually mean? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, and I don't have an incredible answer for you. Um, what the fear is, is that when people hear that your your educational program has lost accreditation, that that's going to damage your reputation with colleges and college admission. Um, it also could, well, we were talking about a new high school attracts people to possibly move into town. If they hear that your educational program is not accredited, that's not going to be an attraction to move into town. So I think the first part of that is that Fear drives a number of negative impacts. Um, what happens in the long term, I don't have a great answer for you on that. Was there any specific reason for separating the pool from the, the main project? Mass School Building Authority. They won't. That, was, that wouldn't be part of the deal, no. huh? Dr. Gagliaducci probably could tell you a few <laughs> yeah, things yeah, on that yeah. one, too. He just answered the I question answer for us. <laughs> there you go. The we did things, try. Certain we, things they'll pay for, certain things they won't. Right. And, and, and we had a meeting early on yeah, and, to and your, argue your, for your, the pool. Yeah, your response on the percentage is right on. It, it really varies based upon the caps. So even though it looks like 56, nobody ever gets their full amount. It's always, it's always less. But then again, you're not going to say, I don't want that money either, right? So. Right. Um, there, I see a lot of faces that I haven't seen at, at previous meetings. So can you go back and touch on, if it's a no vote, I've talked about this before, if it's a no vote, 
that what happens so that the people who haven't been at other sure. meetings understand sure. what that means. Ben, is that a question that uh, I know that there's a 60 day grace period? Yes, yeah, so there is a bit of a grace period. Come over here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so should there be a, a failed vote, uh, the town, I believe, has 10 days to submit a, uh, a plan in writing to the state about how um, they will actually secure the funding and make the project go through. Um, forgive me, I don't have the, I think it is like 60 days. It's a very short period of time um, in order to really do anything because you would think if it didn't pass, okay, what's the first thing you're going to do? I guess we got to redesign this, start to look at it, and all of that's going to take time. And the amount of time that they allot you is really just to do another vote in, without changing much. So five weeks for an election, something like that. So that that would if um, if that is the case, they, the MSBA will not really play around with that for too long. As I've mentioned before, they have a lot of projects where they do need to you know focus their energy, and they, they won't uh, they will remove you from the program and not let it sit there for uh, you know while everything gets figured out. So. And then we start all over again. And then you start all over again, and then, uh, yes, the feasibility study and the schematic design portions of the project, should you be let back into the program, eventually would be uh, full cost uh, of, of the town because they've already, MSBA has already participated uh, once before in those processes. Just, just to piggyback on that, the MSBA is not going to pay twice. So um, if you think of the accelerated repair, when you commit to an accelerated repair as we did, at Meadowbrook, you have to be in that building 20 years plus. Otherwise, then they calculate, if we were to ever close Meadowbrook, then the calculation comes, oh, okay, how much money do we owe them back? Um, and so it would be similar, I would believe, in terms of if we ever were to get back in, should there be a no vote, just as Ben was saying, they're not going to pay for the feasibility study again. But you will have to do the feasibility study again. This one's costing about $1.2 million. Gordon, I just want to emphasize on that one more point on that last thing. If no, uh, MSBA will not necessarily look favorably on us coming back as well. So it won't be, this was five years, and we thought that was a very long time that we applied five six. times. Six years, thank you. Uh, we have 60 but days to go it could be 10 years, you know, or, or longer, and, and with this chart going up. Um, and, and as you said, we can't go without MSBA. Because if we had gone without MSBA six years ago, we would have been in a different boat. But you can't go to the townspeople and say, there's this money available, but we're going to go without it. So we have to wait for MSBA. It's just the system we have in Massachusetts. There's only so much money in the pot. They've invited us in now. And if it doesn't pass, then we'll go back to the end of the line, and we'll be waiting you know, a good 10 years probably. Yeah. Sid, did you have a question? No, a few minutes ago you mentioned if the pro unfortunately if the project fails you have to real go through a realignment yeah. and realign the project. What would that realignment mean? Same size project or what were you talking about the realignment? I, I think if I could just answer it back because I think I we we talked about this. Um, it would be a strategy to to uh, obtain funding for the project. So it would mean what we would need to do to obtain the yes vote because there's no other way we're going to fund it and and. There's no good answer for that. So yeah, there's that grace period, but <laughs> I would imagine there's it's not a very viable option. I mean, it's our one shot to do it the first time. On the no, because we can't change it drastically. We you know we love love to shrink the number and you know yeah. based on the size, but we are where we are, and it will be the same. Yeah, yeah. Kathy. Um, for those of us that have been here for many years, Brooklyn Park's vote only passed by less than yeah, twenty votes. So. Yeah, like a lot of people don't understand that. I mean, I'm not a fool, and I like to spend my money in a right way, but I certainly don't want to take an old dress that's been worn a hundred times when I can get a brand new one for $10 more. And so to build new at 134 or whatever the, the price is, or to, if we say no and we end up in this building with Band-Aids all over the place, I, don't, I taught here for 33 years. Our kids deserve better. And I don't have kids, but I'm full, yes, but like, where's the rest? We all have to go now, talk to our people, and explain to them, because you've been very open, this was a very nice presentation, I get it, but unfortunately for most people in this town, it's going to be the bottom line, 
nice diagrams, all that. They want to know when I get my bill, and I, I'm kind of like with them, but I come from a different place, heart-wise. And I'm not saying that people aren't going to vote. They'll vote no because they don't, you know, agree. But they're on budgets, and I get that. And we're not in a good spot right now financially as a country. But, you know, we do have a one shot. They may not take us back. And I don't want to see it go by. And I live right by here. And I play pickleball, too. <laughs> three courts. Every day I'm here. We're going for three courts, Kathy. Three, three, three courts. What do you mean three? There's six. Right now? We're striping three. Yeah. Oh. The tennis court. Uh, we have to have tennis on there, too. <laughs> You're out. It's all good. I can only be on one court at a time. That's right. I just want to give you an antidote. You know, Yogi Berra said it's uh, deja vu, it's all over again, or whatever. Back in 1992, I think, maybe 93, my memory as I get older, I was invited by the Islamic Battle School Committee to come talk to them about how did we do what we did in Summers, Connecticut. And here I am 30-something years later. Oh, Thank you for being here. Yeah. Did I hear something about that they didn't put a pool in in Summers and they regretted it? We wanted to do a pool, and they backed away, and they regret it. Yeah, yeah, that's just a good point. Yeah, um, Kathy. Uh, one more. I, yeah, please. I'm sorry. I forgot about the pool. I, if, if you're here at night, like I am, that pool is used on um, in summer. I don't care the month by the community, mm -hmm. not our students. I mean, the swim teams or whatever. But I was a swimmer. The fact that they won't give us, a, if you're going to crash down our old stuff, give us the new stuff. And they separated the pool. It's very disheartening that now I got to vote for a pool when I should be voting for one thing that you took away and we're replacing. So it's sad, but that pool is beyond use <coughs> in this community. Disheartening is so one know. word for it. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I had some like other words after our meeting with the MSBA. Seven, we're going to have two votes. Vote yes for the school, yes for the pool. What if the pool wins? They, they actually. You know, I mean, not, only yeah. the pool wins. If only the pool wins. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll have more. Could that happen? Yeah. 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 No, so within the Warren articles, we're going to have wording um, from the attorney that if that happens, that we won't do the pool. Right, we, we have to do the school. We don't need the pool. School so first. Yeah. Mandating yeah. the 63 year old. Yeah. Then you get three more pickleball. <laughs> yeah. Then you get your pickleball. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have more forums, uh, and we'll keep doing that as we move along in the process. Uh, and certainly, we take the input that we, we do get, uh, certainly, and I think it's it's been uh, shown through some of our slides. But still more information to come. Uh, you know, that vote is in November, so keep that in the back of your mind. But uh, we'll keep getting out the word, and certainly appreciate everybody coming here tonight. There was like one question. Any other questions? Yeah. Last question. I have a question slash comment. So we've been through this process before, and we've been denied this opportunity, right? Because the state takes kind of the most needy places that need a new school, right? So we've been denied, and now we've been accepted. So doesn't that kind of say, like, we are one of the most needy schools in the state that needs a new school? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's our turn now. Right. Like they have denied yeah. us before. We've been trying to do this for so long. And I mean, they do their due diligence. They come through, and they picked us. To say, yeah, we need to move forward with this. If that doesn't say anything to our community, I don't know what more is. Yeah. Put it Thank another you. way, everybody in this room is paying for all those schools because it comes out of your sales tax, right? So, it's our turn. How many schools apply? Do you know? Uh, on average, I think they get anywhere from 60 to 75 statements of interest a year. Last year, they pulled in 10. It's one penny on every dollar. It's amazing. Okay. Okay. Thank you so Great much. Great tonight. Yeah, thank you all for coming.